I'm Wendy Hartsock, science and peptide enthusiast. In this episode of Exploration Science, we discuss the science and the business of biocatalysis with doctors Tina Bovel and Andrew Bowler. Tina is the CEO and co-founder of RLS Bio, and Andrew is an assistant professor of chemistry at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you so much for doing this, taking the time out to actually meet with me. Um, I'd love to know how you know each other, because as I mentioned, um, Tina actually recommended that Andrew join us for this conversation. Yeah, uh, yeah. Tina and I were postdocs together in Francis Arnold's lab. Um, that was five years, four years ago? How long has it been? How does the time fly? I think four years ago. Oh my, I think we, I think we're aging. I know. Uh, that's rough. And yeah. your students are graduating now, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we overlapped for about a year and we worked on the same project together, um, engineering an enzyme for the biosynthesis of amino acids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you took very different career paths, right? So um, it'd be interesting to know, if, uh, maybe we'll start with you, Andrew, since um, we're, you're actually my, on my speaker view right now, uh, oh. but sort of how you decided to go from this postdoc in, in Francis Arnold's lab um, to becoming a professor. Did you always know you wanted to be a professor? Maybe just a little information. Oh, yeah, I definitely did not always know I wanted to be a professor, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, but about a year, a year into my postdoc, um, projects started really clicking and science is a whole lot more fun when it works. Um, and when you're doing directed evolution of enzymes, it's an incredibly robust tech, uh, approach to changing activity. And so it, it did start working. And I realized that this was something that I, I wanted to keep doing. Now you don't have to be an academic to do directed evolution, obviously. Um, But I like the teaching element and I liked the taking a big risk on a project, whether or not it's going to have some commercial viability. I, I was more drawn to the, the front end development of um, finding new enzymes that would be attractive to work with and figuring out how to make them do new things. So that that's probably what drew me more once I was at that stage in my career to wanting to work in an academic setting. All right. Yeah, that's, um, it seems kind of late, the, the postdoc stage to decide. Oh, I mean, I'd like thought about it, right? But I uh-huh. never really, right. I never really like thought I could get there. There's also a luck element of like the project worked and it published well. And I was fortunate enough to get um, good uh, colleagues, teammates um, like Tina to work with me and help make the science like rigorous and publish well. That's yeah. that can matter. Um, so I had to get lucky too. Tina, how about you? What did you always know that you were going to be CEO of your own company? No, it's maybe an inspiring, but I'm similar to Andy where I was in the middle of my postdoc and I'd been in academia a while and I uh, worked in industry, I worked at, at Amgen for a couple of years and I had liked both. So I was a bit uh, flexible trying to figure out what it was I was going to do, but uh, it was this same project that Andy started and had this you know, great idea to to make this enzyme that could synthesize tryptophans. And uh, I started to think about what it could be used for I, on the other end of the spectrum where it's like, great, we have this amazing enzyme. What can we do with it? And so I started to, to talk to potential customers and got a lot of really great feedback that there was a need for these amino acids. And so uh, I took the same enzyme that, that Andy and I had been working on together. And then along with my co-founders, uh, David Romney and Francis Arnold, we spun out this company and we're putting it to work. Right. And the the um, mission of RLS is to generate amino acids um, that are new entities uh, utilizing uh, biocatalysis, is that correct? Right. So we're making uh, right now about 100 different tryptophans, which is a lot more than was available ever before. Yeah. And uh, we're starting to work on other types of amino acids as well. And we're finding that these are a pretty broad range of applications. So we've, of course, been working a lot in peptides where you can use these for structure activity relationship studies or for uh, manufacturing at a later stage. But also we've learned that some of these amino acids are really delicious. 
and some of them smell really good and some of them yeah andy come over you can taste who's them. eating your molecules mm -hmm. over there uh, it's it's the experts some other experts are eating them but if you come over okay. i know which one's delicious you can try it okay yummy um so i'm curious to know with those amino acids that taste good and the ones that smell good does that mean in your business plan you're opening up to um other avenues the science synthesis? yeah we are. We're, we're finding partners in a lot of different spaces uh, that can help us to identify new amino acids that, that do something interesting because a lot of these haven't existed before or weren't able to be made at a sufficient scale. So a lot of them haven't even been tried yet. So we're working with partners for materials and for flavors. And yeah, yeah I think there's a, still a long way to go, but it's fun. Can I ask one more question and then I'm going to ask Andrew about his work. But, um, what are some of the flavors reminiscent of? So a lot of the tryptophans are actually really sweet, which okay. is interesting because, uh, you know, it's, it's publicly been known for, for decades that if you look at the L-amino acids and the D-amino acids of just the standard 20, D-tryptophan is the sweetest of all of the amino acids. And so analogs of D-tryptophan, a lot of them are even sweeter. That's yeah. so cool. Like, is this is this related to like a, I think monotin is an artificial sweetener with an indole ring in it. Is is it targeting the same receptor, Tina? So we don't we don't know because a lot of these are so early that that type of study has not been done. Uh, but that wouldn't be surprising. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, that is cool. How about you, Andrew? Do you have any tasty um, chemistry going on in the lab? I wouldn't know I'm because we don't taste that. ours. Yeah. <laughs> um, science 101, don't eat what's in the lab. Yeah, yeah. Although that is how that is how uh, saccharin was originally yeah. discovered. So yeah. Tasted the product of their reaction. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, you had asked about um, uh, the compounds in our lab. Yeah, yeah. We, we don't taste them. We just, you know, we let the NMR measure it in, in right. its preferred ways. Sure. What is the, the primary focus of, of the, uh, the work in your lab? Yeah, so I, I have a biocatalysis group that focuses more on discovery than on making sure that the products we make would have a potential commercial output. Um, I imagine, Tina, that for an enzyme or a product to be attractive to you, you've got to be able to make a lot of it. Yep, it's got to express at a pretty high titer. It's got to be able to do the reactions at high concentrations and high yields. Yeah, yeah. So th those are things that we want to, but we're willing to work with reactions that are at an earlier phase of, of development where maybe, maybe activity is a little lower, but it's really intriguing. Like if it's an enzyme that's making um, a new carbon-carbon bond, which is the focus of my lab, um, although not to the exclusion of other things, um, that if you're making a new CC bond and maybe setting a stereo center at the same time, even if you're only doing a thousand turnovers before the enzyme dies, and even if the enzyme doesn't express super great right now, we think that's an enzyme that is worth spending time and energy to explore and see if it could have legs to be developed into something uh, like a broader, uh, more useful synthetic tool. So, you know, I guess that kind of makes me think about um, in this world of biocatalysis of these different reactions that, that you all are investigating, are there certain classes that seem easier to engineer enzymes to perform? Did you mean classes of enzymes or classes, classes of reactions? Of reactions. Of yes. reactions. Yeah. Easier. Maybe that's a dumb question. I mean, there's just so many reactions. There's uh -huh. certainly ones that have been engineered a lot more than others. Like, when a lot of early work in the directed evolution realm, we're talking about purified enzymes, was with things like um, keto reductases to make chiral alcohols. And those are relatively more straightforward to engineer because you can monitor the loss of the reducing agent mm -hmm. um, in a universal way because uh, NADH has a strong spectroscopic shift when it gets oxidized. Um, so, so a lot of early engineering was really guided more by the convenience of the screening assay than necessarily the nature of the reaction being performed. Okay. But since you, know, you, you don't have infinite flexibility with your cofactors in biochemistry, you'll get these correlations. Sure. So then, yeah, maybe I asked a question incorrectly or I just had incorrect thinking here. When you, when you start a project, is it more about what the, the substrates are and then you go from there? 
Um, so like, like Tina, you're working on these tryptophan analogs. So you, you know, have this enzyme that you know can handle tryptophan as a cofactor, and then you can do this chemistry. So is that more the typical way that these are? Uh, I think that, that both ways are, are valid in protein engineering. If you say I have an enzyme that does this interesting reaction, I wonder how else that could be, be utilized by changing the substrates or, or using that to you know, greater effect. But it's also, like, like you said, with the enzymes that we work with now, uh, from Andy and my postdoctoral work, we found that this tryptophan synthase could make dozens of different amino acids. And if you evolved it for one substrate, then a lot of times a lot of other uh, sterically and electronically different substrates uh, kind of come along the way. Sure. And so uh, in that case, then yeah, anytime that we would need to make a new tryptophan, we can test this existing library of greatest hits and see if one of these is able to do it. And that makes it a lot easier than having to start from scratch every time. Yeah. Um, so both of you started out obviously in a, a research lab, an academic lab, um, and then you've you've started your own laboratories. One being commercial, the other still being uh, research driven um, at the at the academic level. Maybe can you talk about what it took to go from your postdocs to setting up your own laboratories? Uh, and maybe it makes sense to start from research, you know, academic research to academic research and then see what the, the difference is for commercial. You have a flashback, Sandy? I'm yeah. thinking that there's probably a lot more similarities than there are um, differences so. mm -hmm. um, in that. Uh, I mean, just when I kind of cast my mind back to that, I'm, I, the thing that jumps out most was the kind of... Um, emotional uncertainty of like, I'm making this huge career step. I want it to work. I'm pumped about the science, but I've never done this before. And I'm just don't want to mess it up. Um, so that's the first thing that came to mind. Um, I don't know, Tina, was that similar when you started the, the incubator? Um, yeah, I mean, it's stage? a, it's a big, big step, right? That you're kind of, they, they tell you not to ascribe all of your personal value to your research, but Let's be real. We do that, and uh, <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little bit tough to avoid. <laughs> yep, uh, but I think it's similar in a lot of ways. Where, uh, yeah, like Andy said, I went to this, uh, I guess, accelerator program in a way called Activate, where they were helping me to kind of make this transition from from postdoc to CEO, and they kind of frame you to think about these four sectors of, you know, who's your team, how's your technology doing who's your market and how are you going to pay for all of that? And I think that that's kind of the same, right? Like, yeah. how are you going to structure it? Like what projects are you going to prioritize? How are you going to do it? How are you going to get a really great team that you know wants to work with you on them? How are you going to get the grants or the venture money or the revenue? And like, when you go to publish it or sell it, who, why is somebody going to care? Like, yeah. 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 We think more in terms of, um, Maybe the more immediate thing is like our, our the intellectual currency of our research. How how excited can we get other people as opposed to you know whether or not they're willing to pay for it. But other than that, I think everything Tina said translates really well to the uh, setting up an academic lab. What about infrastructure wise? Maybe uh, what's your biggest reactor, Andrew versus Tina? Oh, so uh, very small for what we do. Uh, because we don't have any need to make more than a gram of product. And the only reason we would make a gram of something is just to show that you can. And occasionally we'll run into like a logistic barrier that, that teaches us more about how somebody else might like to use the reaction. And so it's good to be able to put those types of um, tips and tricks into the literature. Um, yeah, we, we do everything in like shake flask. We don't need to go up into a big reactor just because we're not not trying to have like a kilogram of material just sitting in the corner because it made me feel good to make it. Right. Yeah, and I think that on the R&D level for us, that's that's definitely true. But our largest reactor right now is 100 liters. <sighs> and we have a uh, 10 liter bioreactor to make the protein, but we've done some, some larger ones with some collaborators. So you can make a lot of material there, kilograms and kilograms of it. Which I think that, yeah, the largest reaction that I had done as a postdoc was maybe a couple hundred megs. And so orders of magnitude, but my co-founder, David's a, a chemistry wizard. And so he's got it all working like a well-oiled machine. 
Yeah, da- David taught me chemistry, so I'm, yeah. I'm a little jelly that Tina gets to keep working with. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, I mean, there's reactors and then there's purification. So what about is, you know, I guess maybe in the whole scheme of things, uh, where are your biggest challenges in the workflow um, for both? Yeah. Maybe just a quick comment on like yeah. the size issue is that something that's really attractive about biocatalysis, mm-hmm. and, and I've only learned this by talking to synthetic chemists that aren't used to enzymes, um, is that enzyme chemistry scales really well. Like Tina said, she had worked on 100 big scales. That's most of what my lab would do. But then if you want to go translate that, the reaction will work. Like it, it, unless you're using oxygenation, like or you have some sort of ga- uh, uh, um, uh, phase transfer limitation, um, it's... Enzymes are pretty effective, but yeah, then as you pointed out, the isolation is a little bit trickier if you're starting from water sometimes. Okay, well, I'm going to I'm gonna counterpoint here and say like yes and no, because that is totally what, what I thought when we were starting these companies. I was like, yeah, great. I've made, you know, a gram. So you make a kilogram, you just get a bigger piece of glassware and you make some more enzyme and you dump it in there and you're done. And it took us like over a year to be able to make our first kilogram of product because once it it's true that it, it the kind of special sauce wasn't even that special. It was just sort of knowing how to how to give the enzyme what it likes at all of these different scales for fermentation and for, for chemistry. But the jump from gram to kilogram was really hard. But then the jump from kilogram uh, to higher has been very direct. Are these mixing issues, Tina? I'm just curious, like what at the technical level is is going on here that you wouldn't face with any other scale up? Uh, so I think that it's still a chemical engineering problem, very similar to what you would face with other types of reactions. You know, it's heating and thermal transfer as the reactors get larger. It's, yeah. it's mixing, it's, you know, how headspace or, or oxygen present is affecting things. And so once we sort of learned how to, to speak to the enzyme on these larger scales and these different types of, of, uh, glassware, then it's actually pretty straightforward and we still just take our substrates and we dump it in with buffer and enzyme in a reactor and we leave it alone for a couple hours. And in our case, we can get the product to precipitate and just like filter it and it's pharmaceutical grade, you know, greater than 99% pure. Uh, but just knowing exactly how to turn all those knobs took a while. Um, yeah, that's, um, sorry, I was just looking at my notes here. Um, cause we were talking about, I wanted to talk about technical challenges. So that sounds like a big one that you have overcome. Are there, yeah, yeah. Are there, like every startup's nightmare, but. <laughs> okay. okay. And that seems regardless of whether it's enzymatic or chemically based. Yeah. Or whether you're even working in biology or anything like that's just like, if you ask a early stage startup founder, what their problem is, it's always like scale up. Okay. Um, so what are some of the other uh, maybe limitations that you that you see um, in implementing this technology, both at a, at a high scale, so on that manufacturing level, but also Andrew in um, you know I guess getting uh, people interested in in the uh, the technology. Um, I think it's fair to say that that finally in 2021. Most people that have an interest in synthesis are also interested in enzymes. Um, I think that uh, the people that come before us have done a lot of work showcasing that enzymes can do fancy transformations. But just because somebody thinks an enzyme is cool or acknowledges their potential utility doesn't mean that they feel comfortable enough to try to use one. So I think one of the biggest challenges for the field is to make it not just intellectually more familiar because people have read papers or they see hot new companies making products with enzymes, but it's actually familiar at the level of they have uh, dumped cells into a stir flask and used them to catalyze a reaction. Like getting to that hands-on approach is, I think, a, a major challenge for, for our field to more fully integrate with the, the rest of the synthetic community. Yeah, I think that's true. We actually, as an early business model, had considered, well, we have this enzyme, it works great, you can just dump it into your reaction and make your enzyme wherever you are. Uh, but when we were uh, doing some market research on that, 
there was a lot of feedback of that's really awesome and I want the product and that sounds like the best way to do it, but like, I don't want to work with the enzyme. I'm a chemist. I don't know how to do that. And so even if we were, we were talking about selling the enzyme directly as something you would just dump it in, like just pretend it's another catalyst. It's not an enzyme. Uh, there still just was a lot of pushback from that. Uh, and I'm not sure what the best way to overcome that is aside from just, yeah, making it more, more accessible over time. Yeah. Yeah. Have you talked to, I mean, I know that you've got a relationship with Rodney Lax and um, Enzapep or Enzatag, but I can't, I don't know the exact name of the company right now. I think it's Enzapep, um, you know, where they've probably been working on kits, right. That they just ship. So the chemist is like, I just, I just take this out and add this to that. Um, what has been the feedback on that approach? Like, is that what, you know, do we just need to send like every chemist a kit and be like, just try it. It's truly easy. Like what's, yeah, I guess I don't necessarily want to comment on their stuff and yeah, smirch sure. them if I if I don't know what's going on. But yeah, I think that the enzymes would be a good tool for that because a lot of times they can be pretty stable. You could just you know, mix it with your with your substrates, get your product, do it all at whatever scale you needed, and and have that in a, a kit. But you're only going to be able to sell a kit if there's the market interest and that's where we saw a lot of pushback. So maybe, maybe the secret is just to start doing it. And even if the uptake is low, once people become more comfortable with it, then maybe things will take off from there, but it's a bit of a chicken egg situation. Yeah. yeah. So what about, yeah, like regulatory agencies, um, you know, if you're going into scale and you're producing these enzymes that are going to be going into a drug product, has that been something that you've, uh, enzymes are usually not a problem. Uh, we, it, it depends how you make them. We use BSL-1 organisms, and so it's pretty pretty safe, and there's not a lot of challenges there. Mm-hmm. And then you brought up another buzzword, which is safe, right, when we're talking about catalysis. So, you know, some of the benefits maybe that you see in enzymatic catalysis regarding safety, and then also maybe thinking about um, you know, different side products that are generated via catalysis in comparison to what you would see in uh, chemical synthesis. I'll comment just because yeah. it's something that's on my mind because I wasn't, I wasn't trained very formally in organic synthesis. So most of my exposure has been through the lens of enzymes. And then as a young PI running a lab who wants to keep everybody safe and going home with uh, uh, 10 fingers and toes at the end of the day. Um, yeah, I don't have to worry about enzymes in the same way that somebody might worry if you're using things like um, butyl lithium or, you know, HF. I'm, I'm picking the, you know, this, the scary molecules out of the bin. There's worse ones out there. Um, but enzymes are in water. You're not, you're typically working at lower temperatures. It's buffered. Like, everything you're working with tins has a higher likelihood of being friendlier. So um, that's thinking about safety in an immediate term, uh, in an immediate sense. I don't know, Tina, if you've had more exposure. No, I I agree with that. And I think that especially as you're doing things on larger and larger scales, right, that safety problem just compounds. If you're using something that's really flammable, if you're using something that has the potential for thermal runaway. And so with the enzyme, kind of the worst thing that happens is it spills on you and you have to clean it up. Uh, So I think that it is a lot, a lot safer. What are the ideal properties of enzyme catalysis uh, that make this useful for this, you know, for, for sustainability, right. In in chemistry and manufacturing. Um, I'll talk maybe about one thing, Tina and I can trade off because I feel like we could, we could go at this for a while. Um, but the most important property in my mind for enzyme utility is that it does something useful, which maybe sounds like, well, duh, isn't that what the word means? But um, there is a lot of biocatalysis that is done that is intellectually stimulating and valuable, but isn't necessarily doing a transformation that is going to be useful. So the, yeah, I just got to like, the, the conversation starts off by first acknowledging that not everything that my lab is going to discover or other academic labs dif- discover is going to have any utility beyond the intellectual 
um, you know, stimulation that we get out of seeing a, a cool new transformation. I see your inner Francis coming out, right? Is it yeah, yeah, she gets in, yeah. She knows what's up. She agrees with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, as a as the business side, of course, usefulness is is very important for us, right? It's got to be something that's a product that we can we can do something with. Um, but we also have found a lot of value from uh, having these complexity generating reactions, which is things like carbon-carbon bonds, because a lot of enzymes are really good at setting stereochemistry, for example, that are used commonly, but you still then have to make the whole rest of the molecule and then use the enzyme to set the stereochemistry. And it's really good at that, but that's a, a lot of extra work as opposed to if you can have a bond forming reaction. And so you can start with some simpler raw materials and then you know, make that make that complex product that you want. And carbon carbon bonds, like Andy had alluded to before, are one of the hardest chemistry challenges, no matter how you're doing it. And so enzymes that are good at it are very useful. Yeah, there's a, a strong tendency that if you look at any of your your favorite CC bond forming reagents in organic chemistry, that your either your good nucleophile will get protonated in water, or your good electrophile will get hydrolyzed in water. So it's that's a real challenge for the field is how to find good CC bond forming reactions. And there's most of the successes from the earlier parts of the, the past couple decades have been in, as Tina alluded to, functional group interconversion. So yeah, Tina, I, I totally agree with the assessment, but we also have the same bias here. So maybe other, maybe there's a third party listening to this. We should that just wants talk about like, how great we are. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, I'm Get sure people that listen to this are going to think like, oh, there's all these other important things. And they're probably right, but I'm just- Get in the comments. That's what they yeah. are. I think yeah. a lot of people, what makes an enzyme useful to them is also inclined to like, is also determined by the challenges that they can't overcome with the particular chemistry that they're invested in. So I hear from a lot of people that they want to use enzymes for late stage functionalization because the whole way they framed the construction of their molecules mm -hmm. is based on existing technology. And they just want to use enzyme as like a cheat code to do this one extra thing that they couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a, that's awesome, right? That's obviously an enzyme that does uh, a late CH hydroxylation is going to be super useful in a synthetic program where they already know how to build the, back, the, the framework of the molecule. It's just a different story if someone's looking at how to build a molecule from the ground up. And if they did have enzymes that could do the complexity generating reactions, ones that are you know, building the carbon framework, they just often haven't been considered as heavily as using an enzyme to do a keto reduction or something like that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So within the field of biocatalysis, um, you know, maybe outside of your areas of research, what are you finding to be the most exciting science coming out? Um, I mean, I know your science is the best and the most exciting, but when you're reading about, you know, what else is going on around the world, what are you getting excited about? Like what stories do you want to see the next part of? I've really enjoyed, uh, so uh, another postdoc from the Arnold lab, uh, mm -hmm. Todd Heister, who now has a, a thriving research group at Cornell, um, showed how you can use principles of photocatalysis to generate new, um, uh, new kinds of enzymatic transformations. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I, I just think that's killer work. I think it's, it's like very innovative. I have no idea how it addresses, well, I have some ideas like how it addresses utility. You know, it, it talks about these other things that's going on, but it, being an academic, I like it when somebody shows me something that I'd never seen before, yeah. as opposed to um, kind of an N plus one type of addition or, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, sure. people are starting to figure out how to use enzymes more strategically during uh, organic synthesis. And that's really fun to see too, because it makes me feel like, you know, there'll be an audience for the kinds of enzymes that my, that my lab makes. Right. Um, so somebody else is doing the sales pitch there. I mean, your lab makes awesome enzymes, so. As they say. Sometimes, sometimes they're already awesome and we don't have to do any protein engineering or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And that's worth acknowledging too, the enzymes do the hard work. Sorry, mm -hmm. grad students. Um, <laughs> Replace them all with enzymes. <laughs> That'll be a part we'll bleep. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, okay, so um, I think 
what's been nice is that we we have talked sort of about you know uh, what the challenges are, what the the, the pros are of using enzymes. Um, maybe if you could both kind of think about over the next decade, what would be your wish list of where enzymes would be? Um, and what you're most hopeful for. So that there's one that's like pie in the sky and then kind of bringing it to reality. What do you, what do you, like if you had to bet money, what would you say, oh, this is gonna happen in the next decade? I guess I, aside from, you know, awesome enzymes that make all of the non-canonical amino acids that the world's ever needed. Uh, I guess that it's more of a, a trend is that I think that enzymes need to be able to do more of the unnatural chemistry which is something that's of course being focused on a lot in, in all sectors, but enzymes are always going to be limited in terms of what they how they're able to be applied if they can only do a, a smaller subset of reactions that, that aren't the ones that, that are, are needed to slot into existing processes or to make uh, consumer products that just don't follow the same template as, as what is found in nature. I, I totally agree with Tina. Um, maybe building on a different axis then, um, in addition to finding enzymes whose reactivity kind of falls into um, established classes, I think on the protein engineering front, um, my hope is in the next decade that we get good enough at our bioinformatics and computational prediction that if I want to engineer an enzyme to be more thermostable, a problem that has been around for like 30 years People have shown like, we know you can use directed evolution to evolve an enzyme to be more stable. All it takes is time, energy, money, and a willingness to just like spin your wheels a little bit, but it works, right? It will get there. I would love to skip that mess. And thermal stability is a global property of an enzyme, uh, of a protein. It's not like wedded to the active site where all the, the neat business is happening. So I'm, I hope that in 10 years, the field will advance to the point where if I want to take the enzyme I've got and make it more thermostable, I don't have to do formal protein engineering that the computational process has advanced enough that we can just buy three or four different variants. And one of them is, you know, uh, can go from, you know, 35C up to 55C. That would be fantastic. Awesome answer. All right. Well, um, do you have anything to ask each other? Because here you are together, former lab mates. Is there anything you want to know about the goings on of each other's laboratories or lives? I saw a funny um, <laughs> bird video on uh, Reddit the other day, and it made me think of you. That's all. I like that. It was like bobbing its head to some music. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, for context, you know, viewers, I do, in fact, have a green sheet conure that bobs its head to music. And so this is very topical. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was just punch or just picturing you bobbing your head. <laughs> it's like just me, just sitting here. Like yeah, rock out, man. <laughs> yeah. No. the bird though does sit on my head so that he can bob his head while I bob my head. It's uh, a whole thing. Mm -hmm. There's pictures feel, of it on Twitter. You can look. Are there? Okay, I was gonna say. I feel like maybe we need to like make a gif here of the bird on your head bobbing. Yeah. I'll go get him. Hold on, I'll be back. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both. This was. I, I hope that you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Um, I think there's so much more to learn. If there are articles or any information that you think people would find interesting, um, like Andy's newspaper. To learn more. I found Andy's newspaper very interesting. Oh, thanks, Tina. That's so kind of you. <laughs> yes, for example, Andy's new publication. Um, we can actually deposit those links, you know, below, so that folks can can click on them and. If they have access to those journals, obviously they'll be able to read the full article. Um, so feel free to send those to me. And then, um, yeah, I just, you know, thank you both so much for taking the time to do this. This was really fun. Yeah. Thanks, Wendy. It was fun. Thanks for putting all this together. We had a good time. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Exploration Science. As always, we welcome your feedback on this topic as well as suggestions for subjects that you'd like to see covered in the series. You can also find this content available as a podcast as well as a blog by using the links in the description below. Thanks again for tuning in.